Growing up, we had some family that lived down in Louisville, Kentucky. <clears throat> actually, some uh, aunts and uncles and cousins. And um, I had a cousin that was actually my age, um, almost exactly, born in the same month, same year. And we'd go down there a lot. Um, I'd spend in the summer three, five days a week with him. His name was Joe. He had an older brother, too, Scott, who was three years older than us. And so we'd go down there. They lived in a, a subdivision in the suburbs of, of Louisville. And uh, just have fun running around. Was, this was probably like my fifth or sixth grade year, and we're down there running around um, one day, and we're hanging out with Scott, my older cousin, Joe and I were, and he had some friends, eight or nine of them. We're just running around having fun, so they were older, they were cool, right, and uh, just having a blast, and we went to a creek in some woods just next to their subdivision, and Scott broke out his dirt bike. Now, I have to tell you something. I've never ridden a dirt bike. I was the younger one in the crowd, uh, Joe and I were, and he had all of his friends, and we'd go out, and they had these trails that they would ride, and this was a big one. It was like a Kawasaki, maybe a KX80, if I remember right. It was, I remember it was tall, and it was loud. Like, I, I can't even believe how loud dirt bikes are, but it was very loud, and we got back there on these trails, and Scott took the first ride, and then all of his buddies started riding, too. Well, in the midst of this group of people, one of them was a girl, and she was pretty. And here I am, a young guy, I'm looking at him like, man, she's so pretty. And I'm sitting there just kind of, you know, enjoying being around her. And I saw everybody taking a ride, everybody taking a ride. It, looks, it looked fun, it looked fast. I've never done it before. And I started thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, everybody's taking a ride. What if they asked Joe and I to ride? And sure enough, they asked Joe to go, and then they're going around. I thought, they're totally going to give me an opportunity. And I started thinking, okay, what am I going to do? And I'm, I thought, the only thing I can do, i got to impress this girl. I'm going to ride like a Harley rider. Let's do it. Right? So I'm sitting there processing all this. Joe comes back in, and they're like, all right, are you ready to go? I'm like, sure. And I go over, and literally, I'm like standing on my tiptoes trying to get on this big thing. And immediately, Scott and some of the other guys start giving me all the tips, all the tips. They're like, all right, now, now you got to, this is your gas, and this is your brake. This is the front brake. Don't ever hit that one. Back brake's on this side. And they start telling me, gear shifts with your foot. It's one down, four up. And they're going through all this stuff. And literally, I'm just like, Okay, all right, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. And I finally get on this thing, and then right before they let go for me to take off, they were like, whatever you do, don't freeze up. And I thought, what are you, what are you even talking about? What does that even mean? Nobody ever said that to me in my life up to this point. Whatever you do, don't freeze up. And sure enough, they let go, and I give gas, and I've never felt that kind of power in my life. It took off like, and I'm like all of a sudden literally hanging on for my life. I slide to the back of the seat, and as I'm holding onto the handlebar, it's trying to, and I'm falling back, I'm giving it more gas, and I am ripping through the woods right now, right? And I'm trying to get up on this thing, not, not crashing, and, and as I, I'm trying to get up, somehow I kick it into another gear. So now it's like, wow, and I'm just like getting it through the woods. My eyes are about this big, and I literally forget every single thing they just told me. I don't know how many down, how many up, which is a break, which is a gas. I'm literally thinking I'm about to die in the woods just outside Louisville, Kentucky, right? And I go zipping through the woods right into a creek. There was like a creek bed, and I go into the water. There's rocks, I splash, and next thing you know, I'm laying on the side. The wheels are turning, and I still remember that the muffler was sizzling because it was hot because people have been riding it. And I'm laying there, and I'm like, man, that hurt. Nothing's broken, and I'm just sitting there. It was like a total blur. And then I could hear laughter, and I could hear them running down the trail, laughter. And I heard that girl laughing, too. I don't even know what her name was, and I'm just like, are you kidding me? Everybody was laughing except for Scott, my cousin. In fact, he thought I just broke his dirt bike, and as he gets up, he's like, man, what's your problem? He's picking it up, and I'm sitting there thinking, man, I got lots of problems. I mean, I don't know what just happened to me, and I'm going through all this. And then he said something that was pretty profound. He goes, you're never riding it again. You can't handle it. And you know what? The truth was, I couldn't handle it. I couldn't. The truth was this. In that moment, trying to impress a girl, I got on this motorcycle, and I was surprised how much power it had. I had never experienced anything like that. Therefore, I had no reference point for getting on something like that. And you know, as I think about that silly motorcycle incident for me growing up, I think about our faith. Because you know what? For most of us in the room, we have no idea how powerful our God is. None. For most of us in the room, do you know what we do? We put God in a little tiny box and put him on a little shelf. And we pull him off when we need something. 
when we want something. We come to worship services like this, but we're not really worshiping this all-powerful, almighty, incredible God. It's almost like we're going through the motions of this very docile kind of worship. Are you aware that in the Old Testament, in the Bible, whenever God just appeared on the scene, just appeared, the, the earth shambled, uh, trembled and shook, lightning, smoke. Do you know that the people, literally, and they were walking to the mountain that God said he was going to be on, they said, we can't go there, we're going to die. They even said to Moses, you talk to God, because if we do, we're going to die. That's how powerful he is. That's how powerful our God is. But for so many of us, we just put him in this little box and we go through this meek and mild existence. All the while, we've got a mighty, all-powerful God who literally wants to unleash his power in our lives. My hope, my prayer today is as we look at the power of God, every single one of us in the room would not be content to continue to view God the way we did when we walked in here. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much. For loving us the way that you do. Lord, thank you for being powerful. Thank you for being the God who spoke and the universe came into existence. Lord, thank you for being the God who pursues us and wants a relationship with us. And Lord, as we come to this time in this service now where we open your word, Father, we pray that you would just help it to come alive. Father, we pray that you would speak to our hearts and that, Lord, we would understand more fully not only just how powerful you are, but, Lord, also how that power is also available to us to live our lives for you. We love you, Father. We pray all this in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. If you've got your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 18 today. We're going to start in verse 16, but let me give you a little bit of background here. Help you understand where we're picking up in the Scripture. So, God's people are in the promised land. They've been there for a while. The kingdom has been split into two sections, and over the kingdom of Israel, we find a succession of kings, actually in both different kingdoms, but in this particular account, we find a, a succession of kings that it ends in this account with a king named Ahab. Now, something you have to understand, Ahab, the Bible says, was not a very good guy, and here he was king over Israel. Now, he also, not only was he not a very good guy, but he married a woman whose name was Jezebel. Now, the Scripture says she was one of the most wicked women to ever live. Now, let me just say, if the Scripture says that about you, your stuff's weak, right? You are, in fact, a bad person. Here, Ahab marries Jezebel. What's interesting, too, Jezebel was the daughter of a tribal priest who was, the, this, this tribe was big into the worship of Baal, which was a god foreign to, to, to God Yahweh. And this, so, so as a result of Ahab not being a good guy and Jezebel being wicked, they come together to lead Israel, and they begin to literally start to worship the worship uh, Baal, start to worship the Asherah pole, start to set up formal places to do that, start to invite the prophets of Baal, the prophets of Asherah, to come eat at the king's table. They start to take care of them, and they even start to encourage other people to do the same. And it's in that setting that God's people begin to stray in a huge way, that God calls this prophet, his name's Elijah, now, Elijah comes from this town of, of literally complete unimportance called Tishba. Um, in fact, the saying was, nothing good comes from Tishba. But here, Elijah the Tishbite, God speaks to him, and he walks in front of the king, comes before King Ahab. King Ahab, not being a good guy, was pretty cocky, was pretty uh, full of himself. And here, Elijah comes before the king, and he says this to him, King, it's not going to rain again until God tells me it's going to rain again, just so you know. Now, Ahab's not so happy with that, and what happens, you can picture a king that's full of himself, is, is angry that someone came without paying great respect to him, came with bad news for the king. In fact, the Scripture says that immediately after that encounter, that, that God inspires uh, Elijah, tells Elijah to go to this, this ravine and begin to hide, and he begins to be fed by birds as the land goes into deep drought and famine. Now, this famine goes on for three years. And in the midst of this famine dragging on, we find that in this area, the, all the vegetation starts to dry up. Obviously, water's gone. Um, literally, it starts to get to a place where, where people need to kill off animals instead of trying to feed them. And it's in that setting that the kingdom is in complete disarray that Ahab and Jezebel begin to wage war on God himself. They begin to kill the prophets of God. 
and begin to persecute. And the whole time, they're searching for Elijah so they can have him killed as well. And it's in that setting, one of Ahab's right-hand people, his name was Obadiah. Obadiah was someone who loved the Lord. But he kept it secret because he knew Ahab and Jezebel would be after him too. In fact, he loved the Lord and he took a hundred of these prophets and he put them in caves and gave them water and food so they wouldn't be killed too. Now one day Ahab says to Obadiah, his right-hand man who he doesn't know loves the Lord, let's go out and look different directions and try to find some vegetation so we don't have to kill any more of our animals. As they're searching, that's also the time that God speaks to Elijah's heart and said, hey, the time's up. I want you to go find King Ahab now. And Elijah wa is walking down the road, and he encounters Obadiah. And he says to Obadiah, go get King Ahab. And Obadiah says, what are you talking about? Do you want me to get killed? We've been looking everywhere for you. And as soon as I go get him, the Lord's going to whisk you away to some other place, and then I'm going to be killed. And Elijah says, no, 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 this is different. God says, you get, get Ahab here. So Obadiah goes and gets Ahab. And he brings him back, and that's exactly where our scripture picks up in 1 Kings chapter 18, begin verse 16. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, is that you, you troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the bowels, the balls, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, some of the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let them choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. Now let's just stop here for a second. So Ahab and Elijah meet, and Ahab's just so mad. He's like, you troubler of Israel. And immediately Elijah says, hey, you gather all the people. Let's go to Mount Carmel. Gather all the people up, and you bring all the prophets, 450 prophets of Baal, the 400 prophets of Asher. You get them there and all the people as well. Now Ahab loved the idea, loved it. Why not get everybody together and all of the prophets that they've been taking care of and kill Elijah right there in front of everybody? Put an end to it once and for all so there's no mystery about the great prophet Elijah. Ahab's all on board. So he calls all the Israelites. So get this picture in your mind. Millions of people now come to Mount Carmel. They're all standing, gathered all around it. They can see up. It's almost like they're, they're elevated so everyone can see. And there's Ahab and, and the rest of his soldiers in courtyard and everything. And then there's the 450 prophets of Baal, and then we have Elijah. Elijah says, bring two bulls, you pick which one first, and we're going to do a little showdown right here, right now. We're going to end this once and for all. You prepare the bowl, you put it on, the, on your altar, you do everything, and you start praying. I'm going to do the same thing, and the God who literally has fire just come from nothing is the true God. Literally, not striking a match or anything. They're just praying, and it's just going to happen. We don't find this anywhere else in the Scripture. In fact, the only thing even close is the burning bush with Moses. And that was just God doing it on his own. Literally, Elijah is calling them out and saying, we're going to have a spiritual duel on the side of the mountain in front of all of God's people, and whoever wins, that's the true God. That's exactly what's going to happen. And Ahab's totally fine with that. He's excited about it because he's going to have all of his prophets of Baal there, and all the people are gathered, and this is his time to end Elijah once and for all. And that's exactly, they all line up, Elijah poses this, and all the people say, hey, this is a good idea. Keep in mind, these people have been led astray for a long time. Keep in mind, these people have been feeling the effects of a, of a drought, of a famine for three years. These people have had a, a, a smorgasbord of theology presented to them. Worship the God Yahweh, follow the Mosaic law, but also you can worship Baal and the Asherah pole because that's what their king and queen were showing them. This was the time for all that to be put aside. Let's keep reading. 
Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one of the bowls, prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God and do not light the fire. So they took the bowl given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. O Baal, answer us, they shouted, but there was no response. No one answered, and they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a God. Perhaps he is in deep thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Get, it, get this image in your mind for a second. All the people are looking up on Mount Carmel. They see this whole thing unfolding. There are 450 prophets of Baal. They've taken the bull. They've slaughtered it. They've cut it into pieces. They've laid it over the wood altar that they have there. And now they are dancing all around it. Just think for a second. As soon as it started, the people are probably like, okay, here we go. Let's see what happens. Here we go. Waiting for something to happen. But the scripture says they started in the morning and it went till noon. Nothing. Nothing. Then afternoon we find that, that Elijah starts to taunt them. He starts to give them a hard time. Oh, where's your God? He must be asleep. Maybe he's in deep thought. He's all this stuff. Can you just picture for a second all the people looking at this, 450 prophets dancing around this, this bull on this altar, and they're just dancing around, and here Elijah's walking up, and he's taunting them in front of everybody. He's calling them out. And the Scripture says that now they break out the spears and knives, and they start to cut themselves, and now blood is flowing, but literally, just get this in your head for a second, They've been doing prophesying aerobics all day now. They're worn out. They're sweaty. They're bleeding. They're exhausted. All the people are looking at them like, eh, what's happening? Nothing's happening. And Elijah's taunting them the whole time. Now, here's what's so interesting to me. Elijah is taunting them before he's proven himself. Have you ever thought about that? He's, he's not even prepared the bull yet. He, he has not even had his shot at it yet. He gave them first shot. He's literally taunting them with the understanding that God is going to come through for him. But he didn't know that for sure. He was stepping out on faith. He was stepping out on faith that the power of God would be there to do what needed to happen. Let that sink in for a minute. This past um, two weeks, uh, you know, you know we've had the World Changers this past week and the week before the P2 missionaries living in the church. The first week I was the, the actual camp director, and I had a crazy idea. I've said this in sermons before, but you might remember this, where I've said, you know what, if we all got together, we could go pick up a bus or a truck, right? Well, I decided we should do that as a camp. I thought we should pick up our school bus. So I know you're laughing. I, totally, I did. We were like, all right, let's all. So we pulled the, we, I went over and checked our school bus. Typical school buses have like sharp sheet metal on the bottom. There's no real easy place to pick. I thought people would lose fingers. So we didn't do our school bus, but one of the other churches, Monaghan Baptist, they actually had a, a different style bus that had a little bit more of a stable um, surface, even though all the people told me it was heavier than a school bus. We pulled it out in the parking lot, and we got the whole camp around it, and everyone got around it, and we we're like, all right, you ready? One, two. Now, you're dying to know, did we pick it up, aren't you? You are dying to know right now, right? Now, let me just tell you, we said one, two, three. And everybody began to lift together, and we raised it about that far. You could hear the air suspension release all of its air. You manly men know what I'm talking about. I don't even know what I'm talking about. It was like, psh, made a loud noise. And then we, I thought, it's coming up. And then all of a sudden, it came back down, and people started saying they heard crackling because some of the areas they were lifting was like a fiberglass body or whatever on it and vents. And I told the pastor, I'm like, man, I'm sorry. I think we cracked it. And he's like, oh, that's all right. And I'm like, okay. But it was funny because it was kind of a letdown. And everybody's like, oh. And then I'm sitting there and I thought, wait a minute, that's terrible. Man, we didn't do it. So then I thought, wait a minute. Let's pick up this Lincoln Navigator right here. Come on. And I call everyone over. And I'm thinking, in my mind, literally, I start thinking, can we do it? I don't want to let everybody down. Can we pick up a Lincoln Navigator? So we all start circling around it and all this stuff. And in my mind, I've started to think about this particular passage in Elijah. Here he is, he's not proven himself yet, and he's taunting them in a big way in front of everybody. 
taunting them. They're cutting themselves. All this is happening. And he hasn't even seen God come through yet. In that same way, I'm like, all right, let's pick up a Lincoln Navigator. Now, here's the good part. We picked it up about this far off the ground. It was awesome. We got it on the camp video. It was awesome. Comes up, wheels come up. It was awesome. In fact, one of the youth pastors who actually, that was their rental, was inside it. And some of you might know Casey Hagel. He's just like looking around. So anyway, I told him we should have flipped it. That would have changed. Anyway. But anyway, whenever I look at this, I think about how Elijah's taunting them, but he hasn't even done it yet. It hasn't even happened. All right, let's keep reading. Then Elijah, verse 30, then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him. He repaired the altar of the Lord, which was in ruins. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, your name shall be Israel. With the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. Then he dug a trench around it, large enough to hold two sails of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid, laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jar, jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it the third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. Now, let's just stop here for a second. So Elijah says, enough, enough. You guys are done. You've had your time. Everybody gather around. You know what he's saying? Come closer. So all the people would have come closer. They start draw, drawing in. And now there's a sea of people close to Elijah, and he begins to repair the altar of the Lord, taking the 12 stones, one representing each of the tribes of Israel. He builds it back the way it should be. He kills the bull, cuts it into pieces, lays it on the altar, then he digs a trench around it, and then he does something that would have made everyone go, what? He said, get four large jars and start pouring water over it. So significant. One, they're supposed to call until their God catches it on fire. If you didn't know this, fire and water don't go together. So that was not a good thing, right? That's not a good thing. But the other thing was this. There was a three-year drought. Water was most valuable. As they're pouring water, everyone would have been like, oh, that's so valuable. Some people might have been thinking, why don't you just give that to me instead? And they poured it. They did it three times so much that the, the bull, the wood, the, the stones, everything was completely saturated. And the runoff filled the trench that was built around it. This thing was wet. Look what happens next. At the time of the sacrifice... The prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Now, stop for a second again. After he does all this, Elijah steps up and he focuses everybody. And he says, God, I pray that you would reveal yourself. That's what he's saying. Let these people know that you're the God. You're their God. You're the real God. In this, in this moment, may you do something that will allow them to start to turn their hearts back to you. Do you know what Elijah is saying? You pour out your power right here. All this was set up. You orchestrated it all. I'm doing it at your command. You show up and you draw the people back to yourself. Verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Stop here for a minute. Picture that. Everybody drew in close. Here, here's this wet altar, the wet Bull, the trench filled with water. Elijah says the prayer. They're just like they were when the prophets of Baal started. They're anticipating what's about to happen. And then something remarkable happens. Now, this is a weird question, but have you ever heard what it sounds like if someone lights an arrow on fire and shoots it through the air? It's like, it's such a cool sound. By the way, it sounds just like in the movies. Now, I, I say that because we've done that on The Amazing Race, and I've heard it. But here's the weird thing. I know some of you are like, wait a minute. Other things happened. Yeah, we did. But anyway, but the, the flaming air is like, whoo, shoots through. What do you think it sounded like? The scripture is pretty clear here. Fire fell from the sky. 
What do you think it sounded like when this fire fell from the sky that was strong enough, hot enough, powerful enough to consume the bull, the wood, the stones? And then in the midst of all of that, even the scripture says, like a little, little tongue of fire came out and went. That last part I added. Licked that trench of water up. Licked it up. Now, I tell you, I've, I've been saying this a lot lately. That's just God showing off, isn't it? That's just God showing off. Just Can you imagine all the people sitting there after Elijah says a prayer, like, yeah, yeah, and all of a sudden they hear, they see it falling from the sky. It hits, and all of a sudden this thing's licking up the trench, and then when the fire's gone, everything's gone. No question in their mind who God is. No question whose God was God. No question in their mind who their heart and allegiance should be for. In fact, in the midst of all of this, unbelievable. The scripture says next, the people fell to their knees and they started shouting out, the Lord is God, shouting it. Notice the exclamation point there. This was a big deal. These were people that had been worshiping, worshiping other gods. These are people that had been following a king and a queen that were wicked. Then Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. They seized them. And Elijah, and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered there. And Elijah said to Ahab, go eat and drink, for there is the sound of heavy rain. So Ahab went, to, went off to eat and drink, and Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground, and put his face between his knees. Go and look toward the sea, he told his servant, and he went up and looked. There's nothing there, he said. Seven times Elijah said, go back. The seventh time the servant reported a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds, the wind arose, and a heavy rain came on, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came on Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Do you see what happened here? Once the people began to embrace the power of God and turn their hearts back to him, the drought's over. The drought's over. And even Elijah, just showing how in tune he is with God, says to Ahab, hey, you better go get something to eat because it's about to rain like crazy. And what's so interesting is we find Ahab does it. Do you know what that means? Ahab recognizes there's something going on here. This God is the real deal. The prophet Elijah just called down fire, and he told me to go eat because it's about to rain. I better go eat because it's about to rain. It's amazing when you look at this. No question how powerful God is. No question. No question. But here's the thing. When we start to wrestle with the power of God, we have to understand a couple things. First, the power of God is unchanging. Literally. Let me help you understand what I mean by that. The same God who we just read about sent fire from, from the sky to consume stones and the bull and everything in this powerful way that caused the people to fall to their knees and say, the Lord is God. That same God is who you're here right now to worship. That's the same God you just sang praise songs to. That's the same God that sometimes we come to church and we're like, oh. You're a great God. You know, we kind of go through the motions. That's the God. That's him. That's him. He's that powerful still. He hasn't changed. But we tend to look at him like he's in this little box, and we treat him that way. The power of God is unchanging. He's every bit as powerful as he was as we read through the Old Testament today. Every bit as powerful. The other thing we have to understand is the power of God is unlimited. God can do anything. Think about it. He spoke, and the universe came into existence. Now, what's so amazing, he is, his, his power is unchanging, and his power is, is unlimited, but yet at the same time, he pursues you and me and wants a relationship with us. In fact, that's why he created everything. That doesn't make a lot of sense. He's, he's all-powerful. His power is unlimited. His power doesn't change, and yet he cares so much for you and I that he would send his son Jesus to die on a cross for us. And he's pursuing you. He wants to have a relationship with you. But make no mistake, I said this in a sermon a few weeks ago. He does not need you. And he does not need me. 
you being at church today is not a favor to God. It is not. It's a blessing to you. And when you begin to acknowledge who God is, how powerful God is, when you begin to get your heart and your mind right to turn your heart to God, as we find Elijah was doing with the people in our account, you will begin to experience this new relationship, this closer relationship, and you'll begin to see God's power displayed in your life. You see, when you start looking at all this, the power of God is it's unchanging, it's unlimited, and it's always, always underestimated. It's always underestimated. We tend to, as Christians, we tend to do what we think we are capable of. And God is calling us to do so much more. So much more. Let me ask this question. Don't answer out loud. When was the last time you saw the power of God displayed in your life? When was the last time? Notice what I didn't ask. I didn't ask how many Bible verses you have memorized. That's good, but I didn't ask that. I didn't ask when was the last time you missed a church service. I didn't ask anything that would have to do with legalism at all. What I asked was, when was the last time you saw the power of God displayed in your life? And I know when I ask the question, some of you, in your mind, you're beginning to squirm a little bit. You're like, wait, what? Wait. I'm not saying that God has to drop fire from the sky for it to be the power of God. We just said His power is unchanging and it's unlimited. God's power can be manifest in 8 million different ways and more than that. When was the last time the power of God was displayed in your life? Elijah would have never seen the power of God had he not said yes to what God asked him to do. Go talk to Ahab. Tell him it's not going to rain. Go back to him now, even though he wants to kill you. Go back to him and then set up this whole spiritual duel on the mountainside. You see, Elijah was being obedient. As a result, he starts to see the power of God. When was the last time you saw the power of God in your life? Over my years in ministry, both as a full-time pastor, as part-time youth pastor, I've seen God move in many different ways. I've seen him do things that were unbelievable. I've seen him do miracles. I've seen him do things that are just jaw-dropping. But I want to close by telling you the first time I ever experienced the power of God. The first time. The first time was in a church service just like this. The first time was actually at this church in our other building. This one didn't exist. I'd been coming for about three and a half months, and when I would come to church, I would feel loved by the people, but there were so many things I didn't understand. And I would literally come and sit through it all, and at the end of a church service just like this, I would begin to feel something stirring in me, but I would quickly discount it because I didn't want to be up in front of anybody. I would look around and say, there's a couple hundred people, I don't want to be up in front of them. So I would just sit there, and I'd say, you're fine, you're good, you're good, always tomorrow, always next week, always next year, you're good. But as time went on, after three and a half months, I found myself, one particular Sunday, literally just feeling like God was just holding me in His hands. Our Bible study lesson was all about salvation. It was all about what Jesus did on the cross, and I can remember even just feeling and the, and the way I love to phrase it, because it's the only thing that seems appropriate, is I felt squeezed, like I was being squeezed, and there was something going on. I go into the worship service, and it doesn't let up. Literally, I felt as though God was just, just saturating me, just smothering me. And as we go through the worship service, we get to the end of the service, and, and that's where, just like here, we'll have deacons at the front and all of that. And every other time I'd said, I'm not going to step out. I don't want to be up in front of people. And, and literally, I remember them saying, stand and sing. And we used to sing out of hymnals then. And before even a word was spoken, I stepped out. Not because I'm awesome. Not because I'm so courageous. I just told you I denied this for three and a half months. I did it because literally I felt like everything in my life depended on it. And looking back, do you know what it was? I was in the presence of God. And He is powerful. And he is mighty. And in that presence of God, I knew that I could not stand before him in, in heaven one day. I couldn't do it. But I felt like Jesus was drawing me, and I started to understand. I can't stand before God, but I can if Jesus is with me. And I began to feel this, this moving. 
And I know looking back that that was God literally pouring down like, like spiritual fire on me, drawing me to that moment. And I stepped out before they even said one word and went down to the front. And here's how dumb I am. Here's how much I don't even know. I walk up, and what I said to, to Pastor Gary at the time, I said, hey, I just want to thank the church for all they've done for me. I didn't even know what words to ask. And Gary was like, I know in his mind, I could see it in his eyes, you're an idiot. Give me a deacon over here, right? I didn't know what I didn't know, but here's what I knew, and here's what I know today. That was the first time I experienced the power of God. That was the first time. And it blew me away. It blew me away. I went with one of the deacons in one of the side rooms, and he began to share with me the scripture and how I can ask Jesus into my heart and, and why I needed salvation. And I'll tell you, with all that I am, with every fiber of my body, I cried out, I want Jesus. Because that was the only thing that in, my, in my mind that I could think of. That was it because literally God's presence was right there. His power was right there. And when I prayed and asked Jesus to be my Savior, it was the greatest day of my life, hands down. I've not been perfect. You guys know it. I share all kinds of stuff with you. I'm not perfect. But it was the greatest moment of my life. And God has never left me, never departed from me. And that's why I can stand in front of you and say, if I drop dead right now in front of you, I know exactly where I'm going to be. Not because of my power, because of His power. And yet for so many of us, we go through the motions and we have this boring, dull Christian walk that quite honestly, if I wasn't a Christian now, sometimes I look at Christians and I think I would never want that. It should be vibrant, alive, exciting. And sometimes in services like this, when I'm talking about I can see in your eyes, you want it too. Stop going through the motions. Stop. Turn your heart to God and recognize that His power is unchanging, that His power is unlimited. Recognize that so many times you underestimate what God can do, and He wants to unleash this power in your life to do His will. And it will be the absolute joy of your heart. All you have to do is say yes. I'm going to say a prayer. We're going to have some deacons down here at the front. Before I say this prayer, if you're here this morning, because when I shared my story, my journey of God's power, I'm 100% sure some of you feel that same squeezing right now. You're stirring. You're like, oh, man, oh, man. Let me just tell you something. Step out. Don't wait. God will meet you, God will wrap his arms around you, and you'll be celebrating for the rest of eternity. You just say yes. Let's pray together as our deacons come. Father God, thank you so much for loving us the way that you do. Lord, thank you for the opportunity you've given us to worship you. And Lord, as we come to this invitation time now, Father, we just ask that you would just move in power in this place. Father, speak to our hearts Lord, you can call fire from the sky. Lord, you can do anything. Lord, I know that you're right here in our midst because you promise us that. Lord, I know that you are calling people right now because you promise us that. Lord, I know that there are people in this room, their heart is aching right now. Father, give them the courage to step out and be changed because you are God alone. Lord, may all the rest of us never again put you in a box. Instead, Father, may we have you at the center point of our life, boldly leading us wherever we go. May you be honored and glorified during this invitation time. We pray all this in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we sing?
as our ushers come. Father God, we love you. We praise you and we thank you for your love for us. And Lord, as we come to this time and this service where we take up these tithes and offerings, Lord, may you just bless these resources. Lord, may you multiply these resources so that many people can hear the good news that your son Jesus saves. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the, your power in our lives. We pray all this in your son, Jesus' name.